Howdy folks, welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. When I got started in Steampunk, I got my reading lists from the internet. And recently I discovered that Wikipedia has one, a list of Steampunk works, which includes movies and comic books and so on, of course. But as far as the books are concerned, there were about 200 in the list, and I had read a lot of them, maybe about half. But I decided to complete my education and go through the ones I hadn't. And one that I recently completed was Mainspring by Jay Lake. Now, this is an interesting book, very different. And after I finished it, I, I researched it a little bit more. And some people had classified it as clock punk. So I began thinking, what is clock punk? And are there other types of punk besides cyberpunk and steampunk? So I'm going to investigate this. Are these other types that people have talked about, are they actually established genres? Or as the millennials would say, are they a thing? <laughs> So, in the beginning, there was cyberpunk. This concept arose in a deceptively calm era of the 1980s. The writer who coined the term was Bruce Bethke, who in 1983 wrote a short story by that name, which inspired hundreds of other stories and novels and so on after that. And they became like a dark reflection of this generally optimistic and uh, futuristic seeming age. The notion was that the rise of computer technology and the very new internet and corporate power, of course, uh, was going to produce a very dystopian future dominated by cynicism and alienation. The name of this genre, of course, derived from the science of cybernetic, which, which is computer control combined with punk rock, which implied a warping or corruption of technology, just as punk rock was kind of a warping of the very uh, idealistic and peace-love rock music of the late 60s and early 70s. As I said, the term cyberpunk inspired a whole new genre, and pretty soon it was the next big thing. You go to a convention, and a lot of the sci-fi writers were writing cyberpunk. Most of you can probably think of dozens of books that would fit that genre. But for this, I don't have time to look at those. I'm just going to talk about some of the archetypes. For example, probably the most archetypal is William Gibson's Neuromancer, published in 1984. Though this was not his first cyberpunk work. Another iconic work was Islands in the Net by his friend and sometime collaborator, Bruce Sterling. Uh, 1988. I actually haven't read it. I need to do that. But to back up, before this term was even coined, there was a work that kind of presaged all this. Uh, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Which, of course, inspired Blade Runner, that fabulous movie. Actually, 1982, uh, uh, cyberpunk noir... Uh, with a very dark and dismal looking Los Angeles. It's ironic, the choice of dates, because it's set in L.A. in 2019, which was funny. Anyway, steampunk arose as writers decided to explore the concepts of technological change and alienation as it applied to history, uh, and particularly the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Steam Power. The term was invented in 1987, just a few years later, by K.W. Jeter to describe his own novel, Homunculus, which he wrote in 1987. And then he had an earlier novel called Morlock Knight, 1979, which it also applied to. Now, the first wave of steampunk came into prominence in the 1980s and early 1990s, and was generally grim and dystopian in nature. Again, there was a precursor, although it wasn't all that grim, but it's, it's amusing, the popular TV show called The Wild Wild West, 1965-69, to 69, which involved uh, a Western with gadgets. <laughs> Lots of gadgets and, and weird technology and uh, bizarre villains. The time period that I call peak steampunk in 
the late 20 aughts and the early 2010s um, was kind of the second wave. And there was a significant change in the tone of these works from the early ones. And this distressed some of the early steampunk practitioners uh, because it wasn't necessarily dystopian. And even some of the series that started out dystopian kind of became more even-handed and like alternate history. So an example of this would be Sherry Priest's Bone Shaker. I mean, it was Clockwork Century was the series, but Bone Shaker was the first book. 2009, very grim, uh, very uh, technological disaster, zombie plague uh, type book. But as it went along, it became like an alternate civil war with kind of nuanced characters and a different political landscape, which is very fascinating. And it wasn't all that dystopian. And the other aspect that uh, the first wave of steampunk had was that it generally rejected our Anglo-American cultural and technological heritage. I mean, in other words, it was woke <laughs> before woke was a thing. And I explored this topic in depth in a video I called Is Steampunk Political, which I actually meant to call Is Steampunk Racist? <laughs> because there were a lot of people saying that at the time, and I found that appalling. Uh, so you can go back and watch it if you want. I should put a link in to that in this work in the description. Though I don't agree with the idea that steampunk should necessarily be dystopian, the partisans of this view do have a point because cyberpunk was heavily dystopian in the beginning, although not 100%. And, you know, the punk music is pretty nihilistic and, and generally, you know, uh, bash, kill, destroy, that kind of thing. Uh, so this may be why some writers preferred alternate terms like uh, Bill and Kaya Folio's Their Girl Genius series, uh, which started out as graphic novels around 2002, later became prose novels. Uh, they liked that term better. And maybe I'll talk about that, like alternate words for steampunk and why one would be better than the other. I might have a show about that at some point, but not now. That's kind of getting off the point. Since the steampunk genre was so popular, there was a lot of stuff that was mischaracterized as steampunk, which I think is kind of the case with this book, Mainspring, which I'll get back to in a little bit. Uh, and I define steampunk as being three particular categories, uh, which is, number one, standard historical steampunk. It's like an alternate history, usually with advanced technology added into the mix. And always written by modern writers. I do not count Victorian writers as steampunk. Not that I have anything against them. On the contrary, I think we should read them for their own merit. Because, you know, Wells, Verne, um, and Conan Doyle wrote science fiction. A lot of great stuff at the time. Category two, which is fantasy steampunk, which is like, Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve. Well, actually, that's far future dystopian, but it's very fantastical in its, in its idea of mobile cities. And that was started in 2001, that series. And so that's a different thing. And the whole idea of that is that the steam power is in there, as well as some sort of Victorian style, class structure, or culture, like kind of a modest culture, that sort of thing. And that's probably because of marketing, because that was so popular that people would call these things steampunk, even though they probably should have invented another term. Third category, rather rare, but wonderful when it exists, is uh, fiction written as if the writer was a Victorian sci-fi writer thinking about the 20th century. Uh, for example, Michael Moorcock's Warlord of the Air in 1971. Really, my favorite is the historical type steampunk, and the archetype of that is The Difference Engine, 1990, uh, by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling. Yes, the cyberpunk authors. And it's very cool because it has a very plausible type of technology, and it's kind of a different course that history runs in that book. And, of course, there's steam power involved. I want to get specific about what I call the Age of Steam, and I'm not going to go into it too much. That's for a later time. But as a shorthand, I'll often say the Victorian era, although that's not it precisely either. 
because uh, steam power actually was around for ages. I mean, the ancient Greeks knew about it, although they couldn't figure out how to harness it. And there were steam engines, you know, back in the 1700s. But the age of steam began, I would say, when steam-powered railroads began being built, because that's when it really changed things, and you had steam-powered factories and stuff like that. And, and that was early 1800s, and by the early 1900s, they were replacing those steam locomotives with diesel. So that's when the age of steam ends. So I would bracket it from the Napoleonic Wars, which ended in 1815, uh, all the way up to the First World War, which began in 1914, which gives us a nice 99-year range for the Age of Steam. And for most of Europe, this was a very peaceful era. It was anomalous as how peaceful it was. So there was a lot of progress being made. And in much of, much of their colonies, as much as as uh, modern Wokies hate colonialism, they did bring some progress to the colonies. America was an exception with our bloody and brutal civil war. But that's another thing to talk about as a, as a different time. Anyway, the title of this video is Steampunk and its Cousins. So, the whole point was to explore other kinds of punk, uh, and including uh, clock punk. And so, but before I go into that, I'll talk about some of the books that I discovered because they were erroneously put into steampunk lists. And one of them is Wind Up Girl by Paolo Basagalupi. Yeah, he's an American. He's just an interesting ethnic heritage. And uh, this was actually a dystopian novel set in the 21st century, in the late 21st century, Thailand. Its correct classification is biopunk because it's mostly about biological engineering. But the title comes from a basically a cloned Japanese sex worker. <laughs> and this gal moves in kind of a jerky robotic fashion for whatever reason, for aesthetic reasons, perhaps. Maybe so they can tell her apart from real humans. So it's like she's a wind-up toy. And that's where the title comes from. This probably confused some of the compilers of the list who didn't really understand or necessarily read the books involved. Uh, it's highly recommended. I mean, fantastic book, but it's not steampunk. It is biopunk, bioengineering. There's a lot of books in this subgenre, which is kind of like cyberpunk, and then it involves often dystopian results from this type of technology. And so one of them is Bruce Sterling's Holy Fire, which is not entirely dystopian, uh, but it's interesting. It's about life extension. Another is Greg Bear's Blood Music, which is very dystopian, <laughs> uh, where basically this technology becomes a contagious disease that endangers the world. Another variant of the biopunk, cyberpunk type futuristic stuff is nanopunk, which is based on nanotechnology. This was all a rage after Eric Drexler's book, The Engines of Creation, which is nonfiction. It was all speculation about where technology would go. And he said, we're going to be making very tiny machines that can do amazing things, including repair our bodies so we can live forever. <laughs> That'd be nice. But it turned out not to be as practical as we had thought. At the same time, not as dangerous, because the idea is that it could get loose and destroy everything with bad programming. Uh, for example, a book I kind of stumbled on in the 90s was Queen City Jazz by Kathleen Ann Goonan, uh, 1994, which was a uh, nanotech gone wrong uh, novel, um, very well written. Uh, and there were some other nanotech-based works, include Michael Crichton's Prey, uh, 2014. Yet another alternative, and this is where I'm finally getting back to Jace Lake's mainspring, Clock Punk. Like, what the heck is clockpunk? So the definition of Wikipedia in their uh, cyberpunk derivatives article is that it involves clockwork, and it's like anything post-Renaissance where clockwork machinery was a big deal. And so if you use that definition, you could include several other books that take place, you know, before the actual age of steam. 
Speaking of clock punk, I almost forgot to get back to the novel that inspired this whole video, which was Mainspring by Jay Lake, 2007. And it's a rather odd novel, almost mythical in its nature, about a clockworker's apprentice who is given a mission by the angel of the Lord to rewind the Earth's mainspring, which is down at the South Pole, so it can keep rotating, because <laughs> it was made by God as kind of this clockwork device, including this brass track where it revolves around the sun. You can actually see it at night. And in the equator, there's this giant gear <laughs> that is, that is uh, meshes in this track, and you can cross it, but you have to, you really have to be careful because so you don't get smushed if you go in the wrong time. <laughs> anyway, it's a very amusing book, but it's it's so odd and it's so different that I didn't really think of it so much as steampunk. I mean, very imaginative and clever, but that's why I think that the idea of clock punk is is just kind of a novelty and I don't see it ever having enough of a body of work to justify it being a genre um, but the other one that's definitely clock punk that I have read is Clockwork Planet by Yu Kamina a Japanese author it's a light novel it's got illustrations in it and it was made into a very quirky and bizarre anime series uh, around 2013 and afterwards, and in which the Earth dies and is replaced by a clockwork replacement. How, you may ask? Doesn't matter. It's anime, right? <laughs> so I am inclined to dismiss clockpunk as kind of a academic exercise, kind of a, a, a novelty. But jumping forward in history, we get diesel punk, which is a type of alternate history uh, set after the Age of Steam, which would start with World War I and end with the end of World War II, pretty much when diesel became the big deal before the Atomic Age. <laughs> and often these books are also included as steampunk because there's just not enough of them. But it's an interesting style because uh, you can do a lot more with uh, the design as far as art deco. In fact, some people like the term deco punk instead. But it's basically the same thing. And there's a few movies that are of this type, like uh, The Rocketeer, uh, 1991, which is based on a comic series by David Stevens, and Sky Captain of the World of Tomorrow, 2004. And the movie Metropolis, I mean, the, you know, I think the remake, uh, the Japanese remake of that, was also a good candidate for diesel punk. But most interestingly, the the most iconic or one of the most iconic steampunk works is actually diesel punk which is scott westerfeld's the leviathan series uh, which was first begun in 2009 and this happens during the great war when the germans have mechanical robot war machines and the british have biological engineering uh, whales that are turned into airships so in a way this is biopunk as well right but you know, it's still, it's more, it's more of a steampunk feel. And indeed, because there are so few diesel punks, it just doesn't uh, compute on, it, on its own. Uh, but finally, I have to mention a very great graphic novel that I found in a bookstore called uh, Adventures of the 19XX by Paul Roman Martinez, which is a very cool book about an airship that goes around adventuring. It's kind of got a very... Indiana Jones feel with kind of the same kind of heroes and villains. Getting back to cyberpunk, there are people who talk about post cyberpunk, and which I would personally define as a different take on cyberpunk. And essentially, though, the idea is that it's not necessarily, not necessarily dystopian, which is interesting because since we had this big debate about steampunk, and one that they classed. This particular article classed as uh, post-cyberpunk was Neil Stevenson's The Diamond Age, or A Young Girl's Illustrated Primer, as the whole title. And this is one of my favorite books ever, published 1995. And I think of it as a steampunk because there is a cult, basically, in this book that lives as steampunks. Because they can, because modern 
nanotechnology allows them to create all these uh, other these all these things that would be prohibitively expensive in their world, like things made of wood and so on. Uh, and uh, it's funny because that also makes it nanopunk, right? So all these intersections. So there was a number of books, I suppose. Most people would just call it cyberpunk. It's hard to distinguish. And it's, again, an academic exercise. Usually it's cyberpunk is written later when people are used to computers, you know, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more, accustomed to them and not necessarily thinking they're the end of the world. I, I think of Altered Carbon as a possible example. Uh, Richard Morgan's book that became a Netflix series in 2018, which is more about a book that's transformed by humans having essentially uh, unlimited lifespans, which is due to, you know, some of this nanotech and cyber tech and so on. And so not totally dystopian, but very weird. Anyway, as I said, there were other punk derivatives people talk about, like clock punk, which is kind of a novelty, uh, deco punk, which is kind of a variant on a diesel punk, or rococo punk, believe it or not, which I think is probably another weird clock punkish thing. I don't put a lot of stock into those because I don't see a lot of examples of them. The one I would like to see more of that is a cool founding genre is atom punk. Or atomic punk. Didn't Van Halen have a song of that nature? I forget. <laughs> but uh, it fits because it's like the age of steam followed by the age of diesel followed by the age of atoms. Which is, for this definition is, you know, post-World War II, because we had Hiroshima, you know, we had the bomb, through the 60s. And they define it as pre-digital, but I would, I would say pre-internet. So I would kind of include the 70s and at least in the early 1980s as well, before the internet was a ubiquitous thing. And so the examples they give in some of the articles I've read are terrible. I mean, they are articles that include works written by people from that age without any necessary distinction between that and other works of that age. It's just kind of lazy writing, I think. I mean, not on their part, on the part of the article writers. And I would define that as it, you have to be an outsider, kind of looking at the culture of that era. Like, there was a recent show called WandaVision, which I think had to do with some of the superheroes from Marvel, uh, which kind of looks at 1960s and 70s culture. Uh, that would be Adam Punk, I think. Or um, Alan Moore's Watchmen, and another superhero type thing, uh, which takes place, I believe, in the early 80s, but it's kind of extended 70s and very a lot of atomic energy type of themes in there. And uh, there's a one novel cited that I that I looked up but haven't read Adam Christopher's 2013 superhero novel, The Age Atomic. Again, superheroes. But what I think you really need is an outsider's perspective. Uh, so, there are a few books written in that era that may qualify. Philip K. Dick, probably, some of his, because he would have these weird takes on things. Um, also, Walter Tevis wrote one called The Man Who Fell to Earth in 1963, which is a kind of a send-up of uh, American 1950s culture, which became a very fascinating movie starring David Bowie. <laughs> uh, so... This I think I might call Adam Punk. I would like to see more of this. And maybe as time goes by, we'll have writers who were not alive at the time <laughs> writing about the era, era and age when I was born and grew up, which is pretty amusing. So, in conclusion, there are a lot of different punk genres out there that people have defined. Most of them are basically novelties or academic exercises. I mean, I see biopunk and nanopunk as being kind of interesting uh, variants, and perhaps diesel punk. And hopefully we'll see more atom punk in the future if we possibly can have people writing it. Probably it exists, but, you know, people just haven't classified it as such. So anyway, this has been my video on steampunk and its cousins, all the other type of punk genres that are out there, including cyberpunk and others. 
please let me know what you think about it in the comments below. Give me suggestions. I'm always eager to look into them. If it's at all relevant, I'll do them. And I am doing some more historical fiction reviews in the future. Please like and subscribe to help us get out the good steampunk word. Please also check out my works on Amazon. As always, the list of links will be in the description. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary. Music